So this is chapter two of the novel A Day and a Life. I'm all saddled up and ready to go. Any other messages? Anything else you want me to take? The abbot has asked his esquire to go on an errand. Another poor year for harvests, but in the hills where the ground drains well, St Alquin's Abbey has fared better than some. Grain prices are high in the marketplace, and he wants to send his sister and brother-in-law a sack of oats and a sack of wheat. They have a cow, a goat, chickens and an orchard. He is entirely sure they will have grown a healthy crop of peas, plenty of onions and green stuff and garlic, and herbs in abundance. But their land is not extensive enough for grain. He's concerned they may go short and wants them to have this against the leaner days of the winter. So Brother Thomas is taking the abbot's chestnut mare. A Percheron, she will carry the extra weight with no trouble at all, and ten miles is not so far. Abbot John's brother-in-law, William de Bulmer, is capable and shrewd, but his work has been more concerned with management and money than hedging and ditching or mending tumble-down buildings. Brother Thomas has no doubt in his mind that when he reaches Coldbeck, there'll be any number of minor repairs that could use the skill of a handyman. There'll be more to this day than dropping off a couple of bags of supplies. Oh, if you could take a moment to stop by the almondry and see if Father Gerard has something Madeline might like. I don't know, a shawl, an apron, anything pretty and useful. And I'll wager both of them would be grateful for a pair of boots. In what size? His esquire wants to know. Oh, oh yes, I have it here. Bear with me. From a box on his table... The abbot takes two sets of two woven tapes pinned together. The dark one is the length, the lighter one the width. I'm sorry to delay you, Tom. I should have thought of this yesterday. Aye, you should, thinks his esquire. He's anxious to be on the road and it irritates him to contemplate how long it might take Father Gerard to sort through their pile of donated boots to find in the first place one that might fit and then its mate. But he takes the ribbons John is holding out to him, saying only, thank you, I'll be on my way then. You won't forget to send someone else to help Father Bernard with laundry. He heads off towards the door, pauses, turns. Father John, is all well? It occurs to him his abbot looks troubled and preoccupied this morning. Oh, the abbot hesitates. He doesn't want to make too much of this. Who knows how it may turn out. I've lost something, he says, but no matter, you get on your way. The armoury opens into the great arch of the abbey entrance, a door matching that of the porter's lodge opposite. From the small room where Father Gerard keeps his records and inventories, what they have received, what they have given, leads a curving stone stairway to the storeroom above. Jesus was right when he observed that the world would never be short of men and women in poverty. 
as the 1300s trudged through decades of wet summers, leaving grain beaten down by rain and rotting in the fields, need has never been greater. They do what they can at St Alquin's to lighten the load of the frightened and hungry, the careworn and cold. Living simply and frugally, no man of them having possessions of his own, working together and pooling skills and knowledge, the community tends to create prosperity. This is the source of the arms and hospitality they offer all who come to their door, whether beggars or guests. It is the duty of kindness, the practical love that stamps them as belonging to Christ, the wool mark of his sheep that says, these are mine. <coughs> Brother Tom has to smile when he realises it was William spending ten days with them back in May who sorted and organised the armoury store. Father Gerard lives in comfortable disorder, searching vaguely for what he dimly remembers is there. That's not William's style. Muttering, set your house in order, man, and a few choice expletives on the side, he tackled the mayhem categorising, listing, separating, folding, matching. The late autumn and winter is panic season. Just now, at the end of the summer, those who will feel the pinch when the cold comes are not too worried. So everything is much as William left it at the start of the summer. And he has his reward now, because it takes Tom hardly any time at all to find two sturdy pairs of boots a warm woollen shawl, a fine linen kerchief and a winter cloak. Cross them off in your book, he insists, in case William asks if Gerard checked them out properly. Then, the sun well risen by now, is on his way and his spirits lift. It's a fine, warm, mellow day. A splendid day to be ambling along the lanes of England, not footsore, but riding in style on this strapping, reliable mountain of a horse. He should make Coldbeck by noon. That will give him a good three hours to turn his hand to helping with any odds and ends that could use his help. And back by sunset, in time for Compline. He's glad now that he didn't grumble about the extra task of rooting through Father Gerard's stocks in the armoury. It turned out there was nothing to it after all. As he takes in the loveliness of hedgerow and trees in full canopy in these last few weeks before the frosts come, Tom reflects that it pays not to be too hasty. Because you never know. And why make someone feel bad when you don't have to? Why not just be patient, just be kind? If that's the only gift you have to offer, well, it will be a good one. He pats the mare's neck and she signals her friendly appreciation with her ears. Second part of the chapter. In the chapter meeting, the business for the day is concluded. The novices make their confessions and leave. The professed brothers make their confessions. Father Francis asks about the arrangements for the tail end of the harvest, which Brother Stephen explains. No other concerns are pressing. The community disperses about the work of the day. As the abbot goes to his house and there sends Brother Tom on his way to Coldbeck, Father Theodore makes his way to the novitiate. Not fast. Brother said is, where? 
This, if the absence lengthens into finality, will be the first one Theo has lost. Where is he? The novice master gets up slowly from his place in the circle of seats built into the round walls of the chapter house. Slowly, he walks across the open space at the centre, the last man to leave. And slowly, he walks through the church toward the cloister. He stops by the statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He takes one of the small candles from the pile there. He lights it, using the taper provided from the lamp Father Bernard set burning before the morrow mass. Deep in thought, very deliberately, he sets the candle there at the feet of Jesus. He knows it's only a statue, not the Lord himself just as much as he knows the light he has kindled is only a little candle. It's not his soul. It's not said soul. It's not anyone's soul. Just a candle Brother Mark has made from the Abbey's beeswax. But it's all he can think to do. This simple token of his soul reaching out. Where are you, said? my brother, my son. Please, his heart begs, please, Lord, at least to know, is he safe? Is it well with his soul? Is he at peace? What's happened? Please, Lord. Still he stands there until from the roots of his love for these young men arises what he really wants to say. Oh, beloved Lord Jesus, won't you please bring him home? And having admitted this is what he's really asking for, he lets his feet now take him with their quiet monastic tread out of the church and into the cloister, slowly still. Theo isn't sure quite how he absorbed the recollection of this way of walking. It's not something his own novice master ever discussed. He doesn't even think about it consciously. But they all walk like this, every man of them. A mindful, deliberate placing of every step so that their bodies move in a manner conducive to peace, without the bustle of self-importance or the self-advertisement of a confident open stride. The gate of humility and recollection. The walking of a man gathered quietly into himself his exterior in the world only so far as it needs to be, his interior an open window for the rays of Christ's light to shine in, for the Holy Spirit to perch and maybe fly right inside, for the air of heaven to keep fresh the hidden chamber of his soul. Two, there is a stability in this way of walking as though the monk's feet are touching the sacred earth with tenderness, taking nothing for granted. A man who is properly grounded to be swayed by neither praise nor blame. This is the nature of humilis, lowliness, the point at which heaven kisses earth. It has to do with feet and how a man walks in the world. 
To this discipline of recollection add profound reluctance and you have the measure of Theo's feet walking the length of the cloister from the church past the abbot's door along the south range to the day stairs climbing them to the upper floor and coming to a standstill outside the door of the novitiate. His early days in this beloved house, how often he stood like this, one hand on the latch, summoning the courage to open it. Always, why, how did this happen? Late. And how has this happened now, even when he has become the novice master, the man in charge, the one to instruct them, the one whose authority they must obey? Still he stands with his hand on the latch, afraid to go in. Because he knows what they will ask. And when he finally opens the door, treads quietly across to his place in the circle, they do ask him. Brother Robert says it. Ah, you would. Father Theodore, where's Brother Said? I don't know, says Theo quietly. And that tells them they must not ask, because if he's gone, then he is dead to them. Sorrow is the native air of death. All loss is grief. So the atmosphere is subdued and their faces solemn as they sit ready for this morning's lesson. Somehow they're not surprised when it turns out the novice master wants them to think about the committed life, about the disciplined outworking of the way they have chosen. Because, he says, the teaching of our Lord in the Gospels is that unless a man gives up everything he has, he cannot be Christ's disciple. Do you see how big that is? Everything. Consider what might be important to a man. They wait respectfully, lest this question be rhetorical, but seeing he is actually asking them to come up with something, Brother Cassian suggests wealth, material possessions, the pleasures of human love. Brother Boniface picks his way delicately to this modest expression of what he means. Then he remembers what the novice master has taught them in the past about attitudes monks and married people have in common. Treating someone else as if they were only there to get what you wanted out of them, he therefore adds, as if they were only tools for your personal satisfaction. Power, like Influence and having your own way, Brother Placidus says. He thinks Boniface may be going on a bit. Status. Brother Robert knows this is one of the things you might have to give up to follow Jesus. And at this stage in the journey, it isn't yet clear to him whether never, never having had the remotest chance of any kind of social status in the first place, will make the renunciation easier or harder in the long run. Seeing most of the things a man might renounce to take the way of Christ have now been spoken for, and he's the only one who's not said anything yet, Brother Felix feels it incumbent upon him to come up with a contribution. So, thinking of his own private struggles, he says tentatively, being right. And that turns out to be a good one. It actually makes the novice master laugh. Everyone breathes easier. Yes, 
says Father Theodore, all of that. It's about having a quiet eye and a single heart. What the book of Revelation calls our first love. Not that we aren't human, of course we are. But that nothing, absolutely nothing, matters more than this. How I like to think of it is that we are concentrating. You know how Brother Conradus will sometimes boil away water from broth to get a concentrated stock for a wonderful sauce, one of his masterpieces? That's what this way of life is doing for us. Boiling away everything tasteless and unsavoury. We're concentrating. And that means paying attention. Brother Robert, are you all right? Have you got an itch? Or are you just bored? Tomorrow I'll read you chapter three. Go well in this day.